Welcome to Casual Friday. This episode of Casual Friday was recorded earlier in the week because I'm going on a knitting retreat this weekend and we'll be traveling. So I am not recording it on Friday as I usually would. And for that reason, you won't be seeing any updates on my works in progress. Instead, I have a couple of topics that are of interest, that I've been told are of interest, that are connected to each other that I'm going to talk about. One of the topics will be part two of my series on the tour of my knitting library. And I'm going to be talking about books on design. That means different things to different people and I have different types of books that I'll be talking about that will suit different people for different reasons. The other thing I'm going to talk about is test knitting and what that is and what it means in the course of designing something that is going to be produced as a knitting pattern that other people will knit from. You don't always design something with the intention of publishing a pattern. Sometimes your intention is simply to design something for yourself or for someone that you are going to knit for. So let's get started. So two weeks ago, I was talking about going through my the bins in my office that are full of things that I've designed in the past few years. And many cases I've written up patterns for them, but haven't finalized the patterns or had test knitting done. And I certainly haven't published those patterns. And so the first one out that I was talking about that I'm going to be publishing is this one for this mock cable hat. So I showed this two weeks ago and then last week, I was talking about this particular pattern and again I mentioned that I was going to be running a test knit on it and I showed two additional copies of the hat that I had made the previous weekend using different yarn weights and needle sizes which allowed me to produce different sizes of the hat. And a couple of people commented about this particular hat and wanted to know if the pattern was available. So I thought that was kind of curious because I had mentioned that I was about to do test knitting for it. Um, but then when I posted the thread in my Rocks Rocks group where I was uh, putting out a call for test knitters, a couple of people had questions about uh, test knitting and one person wanted to know how test knitting worked in general. And that's when I realized that some people may not know even that test knitting exists or have ever heard of it. And some people may have heard of it, but just not know how it works. So one of the questions that I asked applicants was why they were interested in test knitting and if they had ever done any test knitting previously. It didn't really matter to me if they had or hadn't done test knitting before. I was just curious whether they had and why they were interested in test knitting for me. And I got a variety of answers, but several of the replies were that they were just curious about how the whole test knitting process worked, like the whole behind the scenes aspect of watching a pattern go into production. And there was at least one person who was interested in getting into design herself and wanted to kind of understand better what a test knit process would look like. As an independent designer, I am in charge of every aspect of producing or publishing a knitting pattern that is intended for other knitters to knit from. So when I'm thinking something up, a design that I want to make, I'm, I'm doing little very bad drawings for myself. Uh, I'm kind of, of figuring out what I want to do. I'm looking through stitch dictionaries, finding stitch patterns I, um, that I want to use. I'm thinking about the construction method. I'm doing a lot of charting in my charting software to figure out how the stitch patterns are going to transition in some way or from one type of stitch pattern to another, how the shaping is going to work and how I'm going to continue working the stitch pattern as that shaping is occurring, all of these things. And then I knit it up. Now, not all designers knit their own samples. Uh, I do, I'm not doing that many. <laughs> and I'm not always sure if my idea is going to work because my ideas, the things that I design are usually based on me uh, learning something, analyzing how it works, 
and then wanting and then then wondering i wonder if you could do this i wonder if you could do that i wonder how you could combine those would that work and so my design is really an experiment to see if my idea is going to work and if it does work uh, I'm swatching it in just yarn that I have on my shelves and then if it does work and I think this this could really be a full uh, thing that I could knit and turn into something then I go out and buy the yarn for it. As I'm knitting it I am taking some notes but mostly what I'm doing is I'm knitting from my charts. That That is my design. After I knit it up if I really like it and I think that it could be something that other knitters would want to knit and I think it's worth the effort to produce a pattern, then I'll do that. For me, the most exciting and interesting part of design is coming up with the idea, playing with it, charting it out, knitting it up to see if my idea works. That is the fun part. The part that comes after that, all of the work that comes after that is not fun its work and so for me it has to be worth that work in order to produce the pattern and have and put it up and have it for sale so if i decide that it's worth the work then i have to actually write up a pattern i want to use a format that's going to be familiar to other knitters they're going to understand what's happening as they're reading through the pattern and they'll be able to produce um, the same thing that I made originally. Well, there are a lot of different ways of presenting a pattern. And there's, there's always multiple ways of expressing how something is to be done. And you have to combine each of those separate expressions into an entire pattern. So sometimes you might decide that that presenting the pattern would be best done in only chart form, for example, with very minimal written instructions. Or you may decide that, well, a lot of ch the chart readers the ch uh, would really like this chart format, but the people who aren't chart readers, um, you'd have to write uh, line by line instructions for them. So basically you're writing two separate patterns. You're writing one pattern that's for chart knitters and one pattern that's for people who, who can't or won't or don't read charts. So you're really you're creating two different uh, knitting situations. After that you have to make sure that the pattern is written correctly like that there aren't any errors in the instructions. There can be instructions that are confusing that are not incorrect and you have to differentiate between what is incorrect and what is confusing and will cause knitters to stop or or not know what to do next. So you have to kind of figure figure that out, which is the best way to approach presenting uh, information to the knitter so that they will not be confused. At the same time, you want to keep in mind the really experienced knitters who don't want to read a lot of explanatory information in the actual instructions. So you have to figure out if I need or want to, to provide additional explanatory information, will I do that in the course of, of knitting the pattern or will I do that as separate notes or a separate tutorial as a video that there maybe there's a link in the pattern. You have all of these different ways of preventing the, uh, pre presenting this information. You have to figure out uh, what the best way is. So once you've done all this writing, you get it, you think this is, this is absolutely perfect. There's, um, I've, I've done the best I can. Now I need to find some knitters who will knit this pattern and tell me if, if they're confused, if there were things missing, if there are things that just seem to be wrong. So that's what test knitting is. Test knitting is presenting the draft of your knitting pattern to knitters who may have a range of experience um, and that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for uh, people who uh, are enthusiastic but maybe not be terribly experienced because those could be the people who are buying the pattern. Um, but I also want some really experienced knitters who have seen everything uh, and one of the reasons that's really good is because they may have some suggestions for how something could be presented differently. And it, it could be that it, there's nothing really wrong with how it is presented, but it would be clearer if it were done another way. Or I remember a number of years ago when I was test knitting 
uh, do, doing a test knit for some fingerless uh, gloves, one of the test knitters suggested that I have the instructions for the right mitt and the left mitt in a, in a particular side-by-side -side placement with each other because for people who are knitting two at a time, which I don't do, it would be very helpful to be able to read across the instructions from right to left all the way across uh, when you're knitting your right mitt and then your left mitt if that's you know how they were doing it and I thought well that was a really good idea it isn't one I would have thought of uh, the pattern as written wasn't incorrect uh, I wouldn't have been unclear if I left it the way it was but it made it more clear or easier to follow for people who had a specific um, knitting situation and it wasn't going to be a problem for people who were only knitting one at a time. They would just look at the directions for the particular mitt that they were knitting at that time and then and they wouldn't have to you know read across the entire page from left to right. So all of those kinds of insights are valuable. In particular, if you're coming up with a way of presenting something that you're trying to make uh, clear and concise uh, and it ends up being confusing, sometimes what test knitters will do is, <laughs> is uh, tell you how it should be. Oh, you should do this instead because that's confusing. And in my experience, uh, test knitters, the test knitting pool is a lot like the critique group that you would have if you were writing fiction where they can tell that something is wrong and they may have a suggestion for how to fix it, but really what you have to pay attention to is, is the thing that, that caused them to stop or have some, be confused or not know what was going on. That's what you pay attention to. Their solution might work, Often it's not the best solution. Uh, it's the one that they thought of because of their particular confusion. So my job is to interpret the confusion. If, if multiple people are stopped or confused by the same thing, then I need to address it. I don't need to take their suggestion for how to make it different, but I do need to pay attention to what it is that's confusing them, and then my job is to fix that. So one of my goals, like I said, was to have a range of, of knitters in terms of their experience levels. But I also want, if this uh, particular item can be made in multiple sizes or in different, if there's different variations on it, I want to see examples of them knit in the different sizes. For example, this mock cable hat can be knit in five or six different yarn weights and I've knit it in three different yarn weights and I'm estimating the yarn quantities that are going to be required for some of the other ones. I want to see what other people come up with and so that I can make a determination on, on the amount of yardage that's going to be needed. And then as an independent designer who is selling her designs online as a digital download, I'm selling them on Ravelry, and Ravelry has hundreds of thousands of patterns. It's really hard at this point for a new pattern to get much traction if you're not one of the superstar designers. So one of the ways, if something, some people are looking at new patterns every day, they wanna see all the new stuff, they're looking at the hot right now, they're, they're constantly looking at what's new. And one of the things that's really helpful when a new pattern is released is to have multiple projects linked to that pattern. So people can see, number one, that someone other than the designer has successfully knit this item. And two, they can see uh, the different yarns that people have made and they can just see a variety of finished items that instead of just the one that was um, photographed for the purposes of the pattern itself. So not all patterns in the world have test knitters. So yarn companies might have on staff designers or a, a, a designer who maybe was originally independent but now has a larger company and uh, they may use multiple designers uh, or just an independent designer who's really prolific may not have time to, to do all of the samples that need to be knit in order to do the photography for the pattern. So sample knitting is a different 
is different than test knitting. With test knitting, the test knitter is using their own yarn. It's, it's yarn that they have in their stash or maybe they go out and buy it. And my hope is that people are going to be test knitting something that they can use themselves. So it's something that somebody is going to be able to use and they will either buy the yarn or have uh, appropriate yarn that, that, that they can use for the test knit. So they provide their own yarn, they knit through the, the pattern and they photograph it and, and put their photographs uh, on their project page on Ravelry and they keep that. They can do whatever they want with it. They could rip it out and reuse the yarn for something else if they wanted. Um, but I don't get my hands on that uh, finished item. That stays with them. There are some people who will pay their test knitters to do the test knitting and in that case they may even provide them with yarn. I would all, and I would really call that sample knitting, I think. If, um, if you're providing the yarn to the person who's, who's re the first person to, to knit through the pattern, uh, if you're providing the yarn to them, whether you got it provided from a yarn company so you didn't have to buy it yourself, or, uh, or you bought it and then gave it to the sample knitter, to me that's sample knitting, that's not test knitting, but some people will call that test knitting because they may be asking that person who's doing the sample to let them know if there are any problems in the pattern, just like a test knitter would do. Another step that a lot of designers use is a technical editor. So certainly um, the magazines, the book publishers, and the yarn companies who are employing designers will have tech editors to go through uh, the patterns to make sure that all the numbers are going to work out. Um, if the designer has designed uh, one size of the pattern, they might have a technical editor uh, do the grading for the multiple sizes. So as an independent designer is typically going to do the grading themselves, although they may work with a tech editor to make that happen and have discussions with them about uh, what's the best way to do this or that or, or and, and, and uh, work with them in that way. And technical editing, again, is something that you would pay for. Some designers will knit their own samples the way, the way I do. I'm knitting something, I'm designing something that I want and, and so I'm knitting through it to see if my idea works and I have a finished product and that's my sample. And some designers, that's as far as they go. They write up the pattern and they publish it. They don't have anyone proofread it. They don't have any, they don't have it tech edited. They don't have a test knit. Uh, they, they have nobody else do it and they're just putting the pattern up there. And it may be something that they're charging money for or it may be something that they're just offering for free. And because it's free, they will not do support on it. And they're like, you know, if there's errors, um, let me know, but you know, it's a free pattern. So don't bug me too much about it. So the reason that the pattern for this and this and these is not available yet is because it's currently being test knitted. Now it's a hat, so it doesn't take a long time to knit, but uh, I am giving myself several weeks. Give, I put a deadline of several weeks from now um, for the test knitters to get through their test knits. And so my hope is that I will be publishing it by the end of October, um, but there is a lot of uh, time and energy and work that's going on behind the scenes that is required before that, pa that pattern is published. So now I want to show you some books. This is part two of my library tour. This is going to be a, a bigger tour, a bigger section of my bookshelf than I showed you last week. Last week I showed you, I think, five different um, general reference books that I have in my library. And so this, this week I want to show you books that are related to design. Now these are not books that that apply only to people who are designing in order to write patterns. In most cases, these are books that are for just for knitters who just want to make up their own sweater pattern for themselves or want to learn how to adjust things or modify things like how do I add a pocket if this pattern doesn't have one? How do I do that? Or how do I change from a crew neck to a boat neck? How would I do that? So you need to know well, how do each of those kinds of necks work and then what do I, what do I measure? How do, how do I determine how wide to make it? That sort of thing. So there are different approaches 
approaches to how you can learn to design and some of them are going to be more appealing to you than others. You'll just, you'll just be drawn to one more than another. It doesn't mean you won't find the others useful, but they just won't be as appealing to you for whatever reason. The first three books I'm gonna show you are sort of a, a series of books. They're all by Ann Budd. Um, they're the Knitter's Handy Book series. And the, there are a couple of things that are just really nice about them physically. They have a hard cover. They have like this elastic bit right here that you can use as a, as a bookmark if you need to, um, um, to mark, mark your spot in the book or if you wanna uh, keep notes inside, there's a, a pocket in here that you can um, put notes in. So you could use this just to keep uh, the covers closed if you wanted. So this one, I think this was her first book. It's just called The Knitter's Handy Book of Patterns. So this book has basic designs for a number of categories. So it's got mittens, gloves, hats, tams, like a tam o' shanter, different type of hat, scarves, socks, vests, and sweaters. So there's just basic types in each one. And what's really nice about these um, is that they have a schematics. So I've written some notes here on, on this particular schematic, but you can see that uh, it's got a schematic for a mitten and it shows you, and it's got multiple sizes. So the sizes in here are for, I think around age two, is it age two? So the sizes are to fit ages two to four, four to six, six to eight, eight years to woman's small, a uh, woman's medium, a woman's large slash men's small, and a man's medium, and a man's large. So a huge range of sizes. And you can use whatever gauge. So they'll have the gauge in four stitches per inch, five, six, seven, eight, um, nine even. And so the patterns uh, are, pro are in sort of a grid format. And they can be difficult if you're trying to knit the thing by just going through this whole format. Like, um, like it's telling you cast on this number of stitches and then you have to look on the grid. Well, I'm using five stitches per inch and I'm using this particular size. I have to do this many stitches uh, before I do the next thing. That's a really difficult way to knit if you're trying to knit from this. So what I do when I'm using this book is I get out a piece of paper, <laughs> I figure out what my gauge is, what size I'm making, and then I go through and I write out the instructions for myself so that I know exactly what I have to do at each point. I'm not trying to read it from the format that it's actually presented in. This, this gives you all the information you need, but that doesn't mean that's the easiest way to knit through the pattern. So I tend to use this mostly when I'm knitting for kids because I have no idea. I don't have the kids in the house. I don't know what size to knit for them. Uh, I'll use it as a sort of a sandwich check on well how long would a hat need to be if it was this big around I'll use this for, for that kind of thing if you did my August sock knit along I and I told you about uh, sock formulas and how they work uh, she uses the sock formula for heel flap and uh, short row heels that's a very standard formula uh, she does not give information on how to modify something like that. You'd have to be aware that the heel is going to be very shallow and what you would need to do. But it can be informative when it comes to things like how how big around an average six-year-old's ankle and ball of foot is or how long it is. It kind of gives you an idea. The best thing, of course, would be to measure the foot of that particular person you're knitting for. But if you're just knitting, maybe you're doing charity knitting or something like that where you don't necessarily know who it is that's going to get it, you could use that. So this is a good way to get started on on designing something yourself. Like you wanna make a basic crew neck sweater and you wanna use a particular stitch pattern that you found in a stitch dictionary you own. This is a good way to get started on that, knitting for a specific person. The other two books that she has in the series are bigger. Um, and this one is the Knitter's Handy Book of Sweater Patterns. So this is a bigger range of 
sweater types with different types of necklines uh, you, and it has you know, tells you how to do it a cardigan versus a pullover um, how to add different kinds of necks that sort of thing so these are all and these are all bottom up sweaters a few years uh, ago, she uh, came out with this book, which is the handy, uh, the knitter's handy book of top-down sweaters. So again, the different ways of, of doing that. And again, all with this grid system that allows you to pick any size and engage. So these are, these are books that are really good if you just want to design your own sweater and using a basic sort of uh, schematic and, and, and format for a sweater. So the next few books uh, have a different approach. Um, one of them is Knitting Without Tears by Elizabeth Zimmerman. Uh, one is Knitting from the Top by Barbara Walker. She's the same Barbara Walker who has the treasuries of knitting patterns, the stitch dictionaries. Um, and then the third one is by Priscilla Gibson Roberts called Knitting in the Old Way. Now this is, this is the first edition copy. I keep meaning to get her um, the latest edition. These all have certain things in common, which is that they're not laying out a specific pattern for you to follow numbers from. You are expected to kind of know what you want in terms of measurements, for example. And they're guiding you through the process of knitting a sweater and expecting you to be able to do some of the math or to be able to um, to follow through and again it's not written in a pattern format it's more conversational at least uh, Elizabeth Zimmerman's is for sure and Barbara Walker's is a little less uh, conversational and a little more straightforward Barbara Walker's are and the knitting in the old way has classic styles of sweaters like um, a Gansey or an Icelandic uh, yoke sweater or um, things like that. And, and again, they're doing some of the percentage types of things maybe that uh, Elizabeth Zimmerman does. But these are different approaches for here's how you knit something. And so you can learn to be a little bit more intuitive about it without being led through um, a a grid of here's what you exactly what you need to do in your situation here's the next thing this is requiring you or allowing you to do a little bit more thinking and in some ways or many ways allows you to better understand what's really going on so the next book is by Maggie Rigetti it's called sweater design in plain English um, looks like this and she has different types of sweaters in here things about measuring um, it's sort of the whole, it's more of a, of a designing a sweater from the ground up based on the different elements that you want. Uh, it's just, again, it's just a different approach, uh, for designing sweaters. And like my, like general reference books, I don't, if it's something that you're interested in, I think it's worth having more than one book because sometimes one book may not address a particular issue at all or may address it in a different way or have a different approach that's not the same and one might work better for you than others just not just in terms of understanding it but actually the execution of it might work better for you the last book is designing a knitwear by deborah newton and this one, I really like this. She, she goes through a lot of the same things with measuring and stuff and gauge. But this is a book where, when I was doing the Master Hand Knitting program, they're in the first level, I think it was the first level, there were two swatches that where you had to produce these lace diamonds. So the, the diamond was formed by the little eyelets of the yarn overs. And lace is produced with a combination of decrease and yarn over. And the decrease might be before the yarn over, it might be after the yarn over, it might be leaned in one direction or it might be leaned in the other direction. And this was the book where she had a whole page of where she was working out a particular lace design that she had. And she tried a whole variety of different combinations of yarn over and decrease placement as well as the direction of the decrease lean and that was like a revelation to me that that you could design something in a certain way that would be hideously ugly or you could 
make a difference in which way uh, the decrease was placed or leaned and it would look completely different. And that was a revelation to me. She has a really nice chapter in here on designing for plus sizes, for, again, for a specific person, because especially when you get into the larger sizes, people gain weight in different ways. Some people ha get ha have heavier arms, some people get really busty, some people have a stomach, some people have uh, wide hips. Uh, and so how you adjust the sizing could be different. And she she has a, um, examples of two different women in here uh, where she does that, which reminds me actually of another book, uh, which is by Isolde Teague which is a little red in the city. And so in this book, she's got a number of different swatter patterns, but Isolde likes to design for a very wide range of sizes. And she, when she was designing the sweaters for larger sizes, she had knit the sample up or had it knit up and her model looked terrible in it. And she was you know, trying to figure out what should I have done differently for that? So what's interesting in this book is, is there a, it's a pattern book, but there's a big reference section at the beginning that talks about how to adjust things um, based on if your frame size doesn't match one of your other parts, like your bust, that you're going to knit for your frame size and then how to modify for the bust or how to modify for uh, different parts of the body. So this is actually a pretty good book for that. And now I'm just remembering another book. Um, Sally Melville's book, um, Mother Daughter Knits. Uh, she, again, a pattern book, but a big section at the beginning about, she has an interesting uh, approach to how to modify sweaters. She will say, what are you planning on wearing this with? Are you planning on wearing this with a pair of uh, slacks? Or are you planning on wearing this with a skirt? And, and her feeling is that you would want a hem length that would be different depending on what you were planning on wearing it with. And so these patterns in this book, she indicates where it is that you would make the modification and how you would do it. So like here's the place where you would modify it if you wanted to add length or reduce length. So this is a, an interesting book as well. Again, it's not telling you how to design from the bottom up, but it's showing you how to make modifications and how to, how to look for that kind of thing. Which also reminds me, it's another book, not design related, and I don't even know if this is in print anymore. Uh, it's called The Science of Sexy. And this is a book that has, um, I don't know if it's like 48 different body styles. So it isn't just um, pear, apple, banana, whatever the fruit shapes are. And it isn't just hourglass, rectangular, apple, or, or round, or whatever those are either. It breaks down each of those into, into you know, small petite, or, or like a petite hourglass, standard hourglass, larger, you know, so that you're taking into account the scale of the person um, and the scale of that particular shape as well. And so this is a useful book for figuring out what kind of shape I would want for my garment because that's always a trick. If you go to the store, you can try something on you like and it doesn't look good on you. It fits, but it doesn't look good on you. Uh, and so this kind of helps you figure out what kinds of lines do you like or would, would look good on your body type. So that can help you when you're then deciding uh, how you want to modify something based on one of the other books that I mentioned. Sally has another book called Knitting Pattern Essentials and Adapting and Drafting Knitting Patterns for Great Knitwear. Um, this is what that book looks like. And she has patterns in here. Again, there are pattern books in there, but she's talking a lot about uh, different uh, concepts for uh, how, to, how to create something um, for yourself. I, this is not so much about designing with the idea that you're going to grade multiple sizes. This is, again, the idea of designing for yourself because most knitters, that's really what they want to design for is for themselves or someone specifically that they're knitting for. They're not necessarily looking at becoming a designer um, for the masses. This is a, a little book. Um, again, I don't know if this is still in print or not. It's by Margaret Fisher. She's a master knitter. And seven things that can make or break a sweater. And it has to do with some of like finishing techniques and 
um, like how, how you're going to place your decreases or increases, that kind of thing. And she does it uh, by walking you through a baby sweater. So a small scale sweater so you can learn different techniques for, for how to do that. So that's something that whether you're knitting somebody else's pattern or whether you're designing something for yourself and you know that you need to do some shaping or things like that, how to approach that. Or if you are thinking about doing ribbing and then you're going to transition to say the stuff talking at things to think about so that your seams look better. Like how do you keep that ribbing continuity if you're going to have a side seam, for example. The last book I'm going to show you is one on uh, pattern writing. So this is the book. This is a book that could be a good reference for you if you don't know anything about actually writing a pattern and you do want to publish patterns that you like you you've got the design thing down pat you know how to design but writing patterns is a very different skill and it kind of tells you about things to include. I kind of learned uh, the way I really learned to, uh, to write patterns was when I was doing the master hand knitting program, we each level kind of addressed pattern writing um, at, at a level that was appropriate for that level of the program. And so first it was just writing a pattern for a swatch and they gave us a template to kind of guide us through the, you know, what you needed to include, like the materials and equipment that you would need and how do you present things like the yarn um, that you're suggesting uh, and then sort of the order of how, how you present things in the pattern. So that was really helpful. But then the other thing that, that I thought was really helpful once I started paying attention to that was to look at patterns that I thought were really well written and to see how those people laid their patterns out. Because like I mentioned earlier on when I was talking about test knitting, you can present instructions in a wide range of, of methods. And some are going to um, make more sense to you than others. And some are going to be appropriate in one situation, but not in another. And so if you are thinking of designing something that's similar to something that you've seen designed before, look at examples of what those people have done. Another thing that can really teach you uh, about pattern writing is to look at a really awful pattern. Like what is the information that's missing? Like we've all come across patterns that were confusing or missing information. What was the information that was missing from that pattern? Uh, because often you learn the most from uh, the mistakes that other people make. You can't see your own mistakes, but you can see the mistakes that other people make. And there's a lot to learn from that as well. This book is called um, Pattern Writing for Knit Designers. This is a good um, sort of reference book for, for that purpose. But again, I would look at examples of patterns that you thought were well written and patterns that you thought were poorly written and compare them and uh, and you can learn a lot from that. I will put links to all of the books that I showed you today below. Again, some of them might be out of print, but they might still be available used. And some of them might have a newer edition than what I showed you. So I will give you a link to whatever the, the, the most current edition is down in the video description. That's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group. Rocks, rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.